This is the Building Automation Monthly Podcast with Phil Zito, episode 101. Hey folks, Phil Zito here and welcome to episode 101 of the Building Automation Monthly Podcast. And in this episode, I'm going to be discussing IP networks and the difference between IT and OT networks with Ryan Hewson of Optigo Networks. We have a great conversation around the big difference between IP and serial networks, also known as MSTP and LAN FT10. We discuss why folks would want to use IP networks, how they would use IP networks, and a lot more. So without further ado, let's dive in to the interview. Hey folks, Phil Zito here, and I'm here with Ryan Hewson from Optigo Networks, and we are going to be talking about a very, very much requested topic, which is essentially IP versus field bus networks. What are the pros? What are the cons? What even is this whole thing of IP networks and production networks and All of that fun stuff. So Ryan's got a history that's very similar to mine. He's a technical person at heart who kind of also has a business bent to him as well. So he he understands both sides of the fence. So this will probably be a fairly technical interview, but it'll also have business value. So I think all of you are really going to enjoy it. So Ryan, is there anything else you'd like to say about yourself before I get started? Otherwise, we can just dive right in. Uh, Not too much, Phil. Thanks for inviting me to this. Uh, Pretty excited. I've been in the industry for 15 years now, so... I've been a tech, I've been in the development side, I've been now <clears throat> into the networking side, so it's uh, quite a diverse background as I move forward. So pretty excited to uh, chat about our questions, and let's, let's, let's go to it. Awesome. Perfect. So first things first, I think, is going to be really important for this whole conversation is just to get grounded <laughs> on what a network is, right? Because you hear the terms... IP networks, field bus networks, serial networks. And the first kind of question the audience probably is thinking is, are these things all the same? Are they different? I mean, what is the the big difference in those kind of networks? I know that's a huge question. <laughs> well, let's uh, let's make it easy at first. Basically, a, a network's a network, right? They're they all primarily do the same thing: they connect devices together, right? That's the primary focus. But when you talk about the mm-hmm. different types of networks, now it's how they relate to each other, how the protocol passes the information, and different networks do it differently for various reasons. Right. If, if you look at an IP network, it's voice and data, it's computers, it's printers, it's all that sort of thing. But that's transitioning now into more of the controller network. Right? They're, they're raising their device profile and moving them up from a field bus network into an IP level controller. Field bus networks were fantastic back in the day because they did what they needed to do. Think of MSTP networks. Two wires, daisy chain, mm-hmm. worked really well but it's not very fault tolerant. So there's every, every single network out there has their pros and cons. And I think we're just in an evolution of kind of replacing the older networks and bringing it forward to more IP based networks. Okay. So then let's, let's dive into each one of those networks real quick and starting with field bus networks. So describe to me what a, a field bus network is. And is that the same thing as a serial network? I hear them called that sometimes. And, and also, you know, what would be the pros and cons of a field bus network? Well, my definition of one I've heard quite a bit is field bus network is any, any network that can connect your controllers together, mm-hmm. right? You're out in the field, controllers are on the field, that's your field bus network. Uh, what type it is is varying, like KNX, SMI, MSTP, Modbus, the list goes on and on. Uh, there's, as you stated, there are pros and cons with the network. The pros, in a lot of ways, were simplicity at the time. It's very simple, like I mentioned, daisy chain, two wires, connect them together. Uh, it's isolated, not really having a problem. The downside is the troubleshooting is complicated 
because you can't use a standard tool off the shelf. If troubleshooting tools exist, you have to find them. Maybe the manufacturer has them, maybe they don't. Uh, you have to tap into the network. It's hard to do it remotely. And it's it, it's more of the, the troubleshooting remote sort of connectivity that makes these networks more complicated. So one of the common things I hear is the term bus. What What does that mean in regards to field networks, in regards to those network types? What is the, the bus? I mean, you mentioned daisy chain. Is that part of the bus, the fact that they're all just kind of connected together? Yeah, exactly. Everyone takes a ride on the bus, effectively, and they all just connect into one main run, and all the data gets connected together. Okay. And you mentioned fault tolerance. What, what is that for those in the audience who don't know what fault tolerance means? Fault tolerance is it's a, a method of how successful your network is or how reliable it is. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, I always go back to MSTP because it's one of my major pain points from back in the day. But when you connect these controllers together, it's strip the wire, plug it in, walk away, go to the next one. What I mean by not very fault tolerant is if a little bit of wire is showing and it's being, say, grounded or part of the wire touches the other side of the communication, your network goes down or it's very, very inconsistent. When these problems happen, they're very, very difficult to troubleshoot to the point where you have to disconnect the network at multiple points to find out where that problem is. Imagine mm -hmm. doing that in an occupied building. <laughs> right? You're moving desks, moving ceiling tiles, and the list goes on. Yeah, if you can remember where the boxes are at. <laughs> uh, so you're moving multiple ceiling tiles. Um, so one of the things I got, and I know we're going to go into IP networks, and this is something that I just got asked recently, and it was – hey, I, I understand some of the pros of IP networks, but when we're doing a lot of construction and commercial real estate, they're going and doing the core, but then they have to do tenant finish out. And with field bus networks, they can leave those stringed up kind of sitting on a J hook in the ceiling. But when it comes to IP networks, there's this belief that they can't do that. Is that true? Is that just... How How is that different? Because I know you guys at Optigo do a lot of networks and you've got your own networking solutions. So I'm kind of curious because I got to imagine that's a response you've heard before. We've heard and some. If, and if you need to. Oh, go ahead. Uh, we've heard some of the response before, but it's no different. If you string up your, your two wire, 22 gig mm -hmm. wire, or you string up your Cat5 cables, even a fiber optic cable, as long as it's, you know, you could do your ends, you could count them, you can tape them, as long as they're protected, it's it's really no different. The, yeah. go ahead, Phil. No, 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 please, you're going to continue. <laughs> so when you look at a lot of this, it's you really want to put your infrastructure in. The Think of this case. The guys run the core infrastructure in a building, and that's great. And then you go and do your tenant. But there's no reason why you can't go and do all of your network infrastructure first. So when mm -hmm. the tech lands on site, he plugs it in the controller, it works. So you're not doing a power-up and a communication commissioning after the fact. When all the equipment's landed, when all the IT gear finally arrives, you can do it. As you plug in the controller, you can commission it and make it work. Close the door to the room, and you're done. Hmm. See, I'm, this is the fun part of having two tech nerds doing an interview because I'm like getting goosebumps. I'm all excited because <laughs> I, I want to ask questions, and I'm like because I was I left the field right when IP controllers were coming about, so I didn't get I've designed IP networks, but I didn't get to go and install them. So, I mean, that seemed like an obvious answer that, you know, you just curl it up just like anything else and you put it on a J hook and then extend it and crimp it as necessary. So one of the challenges I hear also, and I know we're going a little bit off topic, but I'll pull us back in is 
on these new builds, on new construction, okay, you can put up a network and you can do that and you can get it working. I mean, they've got industrial switches, stuff like that, that can work in a construction environment. The challenge is in, in retrofit and just real quickly in retrofit, is it feasible to go and do that? Or is this something at this point of the maturity of IP products, it's more applicable for new construction? And I know this is not a, a black and white answer. <laughs> yeah, it's a little bit complicated. It really depends. If you're talking about an IP network, the a lot of IP controllers today are starting to take advantage of a daisy chain topology, which means mm -hmm. it's exactly the same as your old uh, MSTP connectivity. You just loop in a wire, you string it around your rooms, and you're done. Same thing as running a Cat5 Ethernet cable from room to room and connect it to each device and connect it back to the switch. If you're talking about a home run scenario, such as you've got 24 mm -hmm. rooms and you have to pull 24 wires back, that can work if you drop it through the hallway and run it back, but that's not always feasible. So when you talk about retrofit, there's so many different styles of retrofit, it, it's hard to have a complete mm -hmm. answer. But I, I would say that yes and no. <laughs> so yes, you can do it, but not in every case. Yeah, and, and I want to just do some ad-libbing for the audience here. It's going to sound like when I ask these questions that I'm not sold on IP networking, and that is not at all the case. Actually, Ryan and I have had calls before this, and I, he's really shown me some really solid advantages that we'll get to later in the episode around IP networking. And I've personally experienced the field bus issues just like Ryan has, and I see the the positives of IP networking. It's just the the execution and, and understanding. I really want that to come across in this episode. So enough of my soapbox moment there. Let's get back to the questions. Thanks for tolerating me, Ryan. <laughs> All right. So IP networks. Now, I think this is a misnomer because IP networks can be wireless. They can be wired. They can be fiber, as you mentioned. They can be cellular. I mean, they all use the internet protocol. So what is IP, really? I mean, what is that? Before we even get to the network part, what is IP? IP, internet protocol, right? It's a simple, uh, you put an IP address in every device. And the advantage is, no matter what medium the IP uh, address sits on, it's all connected by the same tools. Eventually, that wireless mm -hmm. has to go back to a switch, right? Mm -hmm. The cell modem has to go back to a switch. The physical ethernet or fiber all goes back to a switch. But they're all on, this, <clears throat> they're all on the same protocol, right? So they all talk mm -hmm. the same language. That's the difference. So I could take <clears throat> any tool that connects uh, any IT-based tools, say Wireshark or uh, Extra Hop, SolarWinds, the list was on. And you could connect all these devices together. You can monitor them, you can troubleshoot them using all standard IT-based tools that exist out in the world today. So then, okay, we can do that. Now, you mentioned mediums, and I'm interpreting mediums as the different types like ethernet, fiber, wireless. But within that group, there, most folks, when we think of IP controls, we're thinking of wired. Would you agree that that's pretty accurate? I would agree, yes. yes. I mean, so then there's, as I understand, there's three types of wired IP architectures. There's daisy chain, ring, and bus, or star. I guess it'd be star pattern, right? right? Um, so what are the differences between those three? Sure. The start with the daisy chain, the easy one. The easiest way to remember a daisy mm -hmm. chain is back in the, uh, the field application controllers. You loop from one to the next to the mm -hmm. next to the next. Simple. The other one, the, the star topology, is how the internet works. Right? Every device is connected and it just sprawls out more and more and more. 
your computer at your home or your controllers in your building or your printer at work. It's all connected in that star topology type of scenario. And the mm -hmm. ring topology is one that adds a bit more uh, fault tolerance. The ring goes out mm -hmm. from a switch, comes all the way back to the same switch or a different switch, and it allows it, it basically covers off a breakage in the line. So if so, so if the wire breaks, then you can connect the controllers or the devices still from more than one switch. So then, as I understand it, so I, I've heard one question or one comment before. I've been told, and maybe this, and you can help me, this might be a manufacturer field controller issue, and this may not be a IP issue, but what I've been told is that the network interface cards that sit on these field controllers, um, they have to be powered for the signals to continue across the wire. So unlike MSTP, which is self-powered, IP, if the power goes down on the controller, if it's in a daisy chain or in a ring pattern, does it lose? Is that does it lose communication? Is that a manufacturer thing? Uh, am I even making sense? Does this question make sense? No, it makes perfect sense. So when you build these controllers, you typically order parts from wherever <coughs> your uh, your standard electronics mm -hmm. wholesaler, and you stick it in your controller. And you're absolutely right. When it doesn't have power, it doesn't pass the communication on. But these controller manufacturers are getting smart. And now what they'll do is they'll put a relay in. Mm -hmm. So when it detects no power, they'll just connect all the wires together. Oh, really? That That is yeah. – that's really cool because we used to do something similar to that. And I'm sure you remember this when you had to switch supervisory devices for – um, to have failover, but you couldn't really do that. So you'd put in those little relays that would switch over the field buses. Yes. Oh, like all of the sensors and all that sort yeah, of stuff? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that was some fun testing. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> I, that's giving me shivers on those days. <laughs> I know, man. I mean, uh, yeah. <laughs> okay, so Star then is basically point to point, right? It's from switch port to network interface card port. Yeah, and you just keep going along and along, okay. right? If there's no particular pattern, you just branch it out where you need to. Now, one of the things in, in my ignorance that, and it may be my ignorance, I may be spot on, I may be, be like some savant genius here, or I may just be speaking out of ignorance. I tend to have strong opinions. Uh, so <laughs> we'll find out. Yeah. So one of the things I've been saying to folks is that supervisory devices, their main purpose originally was as protocol gateways to take field bus networks and convert them to IP or whatever network level protocols. So with IP field controllers coming out, and then with, as I understand field controllers, you've got folks like EZIO, you've got folks like Johnson, like Distech, who have field controllers, they have built-in clocks, some of them have built-in graphics. Is it possible that the supervisory device is no longer super critical to BAS architectures, and maybe now we can have field controllers, at maybe on a small scale, maybe not large scale, but field controllers that go directly to a server or directly host graphics themselves? It's a good question, and you're seeing it already. A lot of IP-enabled controllers are hosting the whole solution on their own. Mm -hmm. The difference in the controller architecture is where you're placing these. Mm -hmm. Think of a strip mall with a small store in it. Mm -hmm. Do they really need a full enabled commercial control system? Maybe. But they could also get away with, if they're only a single tenant and aren't connected to a major control system, then you could run your single rooftop unit with a graphic enabled controller and have access and still maintain the energy savings, but only in your local sort of area. When you talk about all these, let, let's look at a building and let's say every single controller on it, including the stat on the wall is IP enabled, right? Mm -hmm. Everything. The 
what happens is it changes. So when you say supervisory, a lot of it is data collection, right? Collect all the data, mm -hmm. morph it a little bit, and then present it to something else higher up. I don't think that that type of thing is going to change necessarily. I think there's always going to be something that's going to collect the data and present it in a different way, mm -hmm. uh, especially when you start talking about analytics. Right? Are, are, is it possible in thousands of devices in a room or in a building and send all that information up to a single point to try and run analytics on it and provide some sort of data? Probably not, because eventually you're not going to have a big enough pipe or, or enough bandwidth to handle all that. You'd constantly be streaming traffic. Hey, let me pause so, you on that real quick. I, sure. I want to discuss that because um, I don't know if I agree with that. And, I mean, we look at sensor networks all the time that are doing that, and our BAS data isn't that huge. And isn't that the whole point of IP to go oh, and have more bandwidth? I mean, couldn't servers just be virtualized and scale? I'm, I'm asking this out of curiosity because I think we're both speculating on the future of a BAS industry. And But at the same time, I'm just curious about that because why do you think we're going to run out of bandwidth? Well, and, and you're absolutely right. We're, we're totally speculating here, but Here's what I think what's going to happen is mm -hmm. once we go forward, everything's going to start to sit on a converged network, mm -hmm. right? Right now, security cameras are isolated and sitting on their own mm -hmm. network. But for what reason? We could bring those in and tie them together with the HVAC, the access control, and the lighting, and start having a more combined system. Now you've added so much more data on the network in conjunction with more comfort occupant settings, uh, a lot more sensor data based on people. Mm -hmm. It's just going to be more and more data. And when I say that's going to be lifted up to the top, mm -hmm. the more efficient method of sort of handling that would be to do some edge analytics. Yeah. Right? Do I need to see all the individual bits or do I just need to see that, hey, that guy's happy? Right, give me a comfort index number, mm -hmm. things like that. It it doesn't make sense to pass it all the way up, crunch it, and pass something back when you could do some of it locally. You know, it's it's interesting you bring that up because so when I was back at my previous employer, one of the things that I did several years back was do an analysis of that edge building in Amsterdam, and I, I looked at what was because it was kind of the first really, you know, highlighted smart building. And I won't get into whether that, you know, was a good design or a bad design or feasible or not. That's neither here nor there. But the important thing is one of the points I pulled out when I was doing some research on the internet on that was that the operator was saying that the 20 to 30,000 data points an hour was just overwhelming. So, I think you, you hit nail on the head there with edge analytics. I don't know if all of our audience knows what edge analytics are, so I think it'd be good to explore that real briefly. Yeah, sure, we can absolutely do that. So just when, what is that? When you talk about analytics, it's basically gathering data, putting it in a source, and crunching, crunching the data. Right, find patterns, find usage. That's how energy analytics work. They pull up all of these trend logs that are collecting sensor mm -hmm. level data, and it tells you if your building's running good or bad, or how much energy you're spending. The more data you have, you can actually do some of that analytic processing down mm -hmm. at the controller device. So, such as a room level energy. I don't need to send up 15 different trend logs necessarily to give me the same information that I could if I just crunched the data locally at the controller. Hmm. Right. I know that there's companies out there now that just give you a room index. Are you outside of engineered design or are you not? And they will you know, throw a red or a green leaf up on the wall and it gives you an indication of if you're pulling too much power or not or too much energy. That's an example of the edge analytics. 
If you don't do that, then you can ship it all up to the top supervisor or the, the big controller up at the top. But that's, like you say, a lot of data to look at. And it takes time to process it. So it's, okay. it's just a more efficient way of still getting your analytics, but being able to, uh, back to the words of, distribute it. Hmm. All right. So then one more thing I want to discuss is that field bus networks. And you and I had a really good call about two months ago. That's how long we've been planning this. No um so, yeah, about two months ago, we talked about field bus networks. And you and I were having really good conversations around what were the cons of field bus networks. And it'd be interesting to kind of rehash some of the highlights. And those highlights, as I remember them, were, you know, wire location, you know, basically anything about the physical wire, how it's terminated, how it's wired addressing, speed mismatches, all sorts of stuff. So what do you find as the major cons of field bus networks? First and foremost, the wiring of them. And there's no simple tools. Let's, let's use a, my favorite example, MSTP network. I mm-hmm. cannot place, so once I wire up 25 controllers, and before I turn it on, I can't test the wire. I can technically maybe using a Mager or some sort of crazy tool, possibly an oscilloscope, yeah. but that's not a standard tech tool. And I, I can't see any tech really dragging an oscilloscope around in the field, right? It's yeah. not really a, not really possible. So there's the testing tool. This doesn't exist until you turn it on, plug it into your software and go, Oh, I am only getting half the devices. Okay, now you're in for a track to go figure it out and find it. And it's there's not really great tools out there to say, oh, it's controller 10 and that's the problem. Go to X room and fix it. Mm-hmm. Right? If there was, I would probably still be in the field today. <laughs> yeah, I'd have a lot more hair. <laughs> yeah, that's a, that's a whole other discussion. <laughs> so with IP field controllers then, what – what are the benefits to IP field controllers? So now when you move it to IP, when I run that single cat five or fiber wire or even wireless, I can test it before I connect it in, right? There's tons of tools out there, simple low cost tools to test your ends on an ethernet connection. Plug it in one end, plug it in in the other, it says your wires are crossed, re-terminate. Or, you could even go so far as buying standard 50 foot or 100 foot lengths of pre-terminated wire and install those in your building. So mm-hmm. you know it's already pre-tested from the factory and you just install. So now you've got a good measure of uh, reliability and uh, confidence that your wiring is going to work. So you plug it in, bring up your devices, give them an IP address, and you're off and running. So your time to commissioning is much quicker, and if there's a problem, you've got enough troubleshooting tools at your disposal to fix it in a timely manner. Hmm. So what kind of cost difference are you seeing on average between a a field bus and an equivalent IP when you factor in labor efficiency and things like that? From the start of the install to the finish? Yeah. Yeah. It's because I know you've got a pretty big database of installed data. Yeah, it's changing. It's definitely changing right now. If it's straight IP, I would say the cost potentially is a little bit higher. But as the second that we put that into POE, POE changes mm-hmm. the game. POE brings your cost almost uh, in equality. Really, pretty close. And is is that because, and I'm not trying to sit here and turn this into an Optigo commercial, but is that because you guys have your own PoE switches that are lower cost than the standard off the shelf, you know, full blown IT switches? Is is that what's making that difference, or is it the removal of the power runs? And I mean, what is it? Because I just a little background that you may not know, Ryan. Prior to um, 
running my business, ran the integration program for JCI from the technical side. And one of the challenges was looking at, you know, the, the cost of POE. That was an industry challenge that a lot of folks were, were asking about. You had, I think it started with Delta maybe up in Canada where they started really pushing POE. And then a lot of folks were saying, well, how do you afford that? So, so are you able to dive into that a little bit? Just kind of, I know things have changed a lot in the past several years. <laughs> yeah, I could dive in for sure. The initially the cost of POE was, was fairly high and probably the overage on a job would cost you anywhere from 20 to 25%. However, yeah, that sounds about right. However, look at the past couple of years when all these devices, even coming from the consumer, a lot of things are now going POE, right? They're, Cisco's running their, their UPOE spec, uh, POE is moving to a higher wattage spec, almost into the 90 watt range. Mm-hmm. So the, as technology always does, it starts to drop as the number of installations the devices sold goes up. So that cost overage of maybe 20, 25% is now dropping quite significantly simply because of there's more of it out there. So now it starts to become worth it. When you say uh, the cost on the switches, I think that's more mm-hmm. of a, a minimal side because there's not as many switches as there are running individual power to each controller. So it's the, re- the removal of the mm. power is the key. Interesting. And the labor associated with that. That's one. right. Because think of your labor pool. You're not necessarily using a union-based electrician and their wage because they're not required. That's in, so you're seeing that that's acceptable because that's one of the things that uh, we I was kind of just thinking like, would we have to go and use union labor still? I mean, it's technically it's low voltage communication wiring now. You're seeing folks being okay with that. Some are. On, on the broader scale. But again, think of a building that runs the uh, communications division and they have to run communication out. So they're already running that line. So now when, they, when the, yeah. the power side comes up, well, sorry, it's already run. It's already there. You can, you can go plug, yeah. plug in the switch if you want. <laughs> yeah. Interesting. Okay. So switching gears. You know, one of the things that I know you folks at, at Optigo have been very vocal about, and I think um, only Cisco is the only other one I can think of who has been super vocal about this. Maybe there's others. I just, I notice your marketing and I notice Cisco's marketing. And that is this topic of OT versus IT networks. I mean, what the heck does that even mean? That just... I'll be honest, when I first heard it, I was like, that sounds like a really sexy marketing speak. But, I mean, is there actually something there? Yeah, it's completely there. So when when you think back in the day in your field bus networks, Mm -hmm. that never, ever tied into IT networks. And, And the way we stayed IT is all of the voice and data services in a building. Those are your your printers and your computers and your CRM hosted software and all of that op- that IT based things that need a building to run, right? When we talk about the OT side of the network, uh, we call it operational technology side. The reason why we look at it this way is that's the everything that makes a building work. That your fire alarms, that your elevators, your access control, HVAC, lighting so on and so forth. The reason why we want those isolated, there's quite a few reasons, but there's there's some core reasons, and it's the, the skills between the two different sides. So technically, it's all the same. They're all IP-based networks. They all work on the same set of switches. It's all the same. The people who run and install the different sides of the networks are very, very different. I'll take a an IT room or an IT where all the the hosted equipment is. The IT guys are not really mm-hmm. going to let the HVAC guys in there and play around in that room. But the HVAC guys have to go in and work on the equipment that services the room, right? 
got to make it cold or it's mm -hmm. not going to work. So now the HVAC guy has to go in and he needs access to part of the network to make sure that his uh, Ethernet or IP cable is connected and he needs to make sure that he can make sure that that unit runs. So now he has to go to the IT guy because the IT guy runs all of the switch gear, work with the IT guy, and make sure it's connected, and then he, he's got the okay. Now, middle of the night, something happens in that poor little IT room, and the, the unit goes offline. So now the IT room's starting to cook. It's getting way too warm. Okay, who do you call? HVAC guy doesn't have access to the... Uh, the IP side of the network, so he can't really tell if it's a, if it's his controller, if the switch failed, he has no idea. Mm -hmm. Now you have to get a hold of the IT guy to come down and help you out. I mean, it's it's there's so much problem in the skills gap that one can't do the job without the other. So what we mm -hmm. want to do here is is bridge the skills gap. So what you want is you want the HVAC guy to have just enough access to the network that he can do his job. And I'm not saying he needs access to the CRM or the HR database or anything else. I mean, that's way beyond uh, any technician. And they don't need to know that level of knowledge anyways. But they need to know enough to get their controllers up and running and be able to service their side of the network. On the other side of the fence, IT doesn't need to know all the HVAC stuff, but they can have a window into all of the sort of IP and networking perspective in the technician side of the fence, but he just needs to supervise it. So he doesn't need to control it or learn it or anything else. So kind of in summary there, it's the OT guys work with the IT guys, but let us mm -hmm. technicians have all the tools to do our job. Let IT have some knowledge and insight into what we're doing so that everybody's happy. So what I heard you say is the operation technology network, the OT network, is another network segment that may or may not be isolated from the IT network. And... If it is connected, it's kind of bridged. That allows for kind of a secure point of kind of boundary of separation. It also allows for support and management, which kind of leads me into my next question. But first off, that, that understanding is correct, right? Right, yes. Okay. So then that brings me into my next question. When I started to hear about this OT network, some of the white papers I read were like, almost saying eliminate IT and never have to talk to an IT person ever again. And I'm not saying this was your stuff that was saying this, but um, that's basically what it came across as. It was like, don't want to talk to IT? Well, that's fine. Build an OT network. And then I started thinking to myself, I'm like, okay, but what about switches, servers, database management? I mean, are we going to be training techs to be, DBAs now, database administrators, and are we going to be sending them all to get network, you know, CCIE certified or whatever? And uh, is that true, or is are we kind of really more towards where you were saying, which is there's still a connection to IT. It's just a managed connection, and maybe we put the servers in the IT network. I mean, is what are you seeing? Yeah, the... I mean, if you're going to isolate it completely, basically your your integrators are going to be hiring their own IT department to manage it, and that really doesn't make sense in a building. So working together is still the, the key aspect. The, the point is working together in the right spot. Mm -hmm. When you talk about your servers and your uh, all of the switches and the databases, the servers and databases, either if the tech... If the technician, the integrators are savvy, they can do it. If not, then IT can do it. The part that we're really talking about here is all of the switches, right? Yeah. So in an OT side of the network, you really don't need all the capability that a traditional IT-based switch needs. Do you really need a Cisco or an HP Dell Juniper system in your 
building connecting controllers? Probably not. So, but what you need is you need to work with IT to give you, um, someone's got to give you the IP addresses, right? Someone's got to work the uh, mm -hmm. firewall. Someone's got to work the router. But that doesn't have to be us as technicians. Let IT handle that. All we want on the OT side is, am I connected to the switch? Is the switch online? Show me some traffic rates, uh, all of that sort of data. Let me do my job and make sure that the controllers are connected and running. Right? I don't want to have to keep chasing IT to do that. So there's absolutely a place that we can all work together. But I have a certain set of skills. IT has a certain set of skills. There's no point bridging the gap. Let's just do our part. And that's really what we're pushing here. So let me recap what you just what I heard you just say. What I heard you just say is rather than having a super ultra featured managed switch that has all these capabilities, you have kind of a more BAS focused switch model. And then that has a trunk link that goes up to some sort of IT managed router, which acts as the default gateway and distributes the IP addresses for the OT network. You nailed it, exactly. Okay, cool. So then with that being said, that kind of answers our, our – and I agree with you. I mean, most system integrators, if they're not comfortable dealing with a server and a SQL database, then that's kind of scary because that's been around for like 10, 15 years. But that's neither here nor there. With that being said, though, so they connect the OT and the IT network, but how? Like – do they go and just the, the system integrator just comes to IT one day and says, oh, by the way, I'm installing a, a BAS, so I'll be putting a switch in, and you're going to give me a trunk link to my – I mean, can't imagine that goes very well. Is there planning before this? What are you seeing as the process? I think there's, there's always going to be planning, and you're always going to have that conversation with your IT guy. The difference here is the – you can put in your OT side of the network before IT lands their equipment on site. As we, as we know, IT always does it late, very late in the job, mm -hmm. which doesn't help controls very much because you go, okay, things are landed, we're done. Well, we need a month to commission, right? So, mm -hmm. uh, yes, you have to work with IT, but it's in a much simpler capacity. Uh, I, don't, I don't want to promote our system in, on this podcast, but in a lot of these type of networks, uh, potentially Cisco's as well, you only need to have a single IP address and then, or sorry, you need a single management side or a management appliance on the OT side yeah. that you can handle everything. And then when you're, when IT is ready, you just plug in a single wire and now you're off and running. Right. That's the advantage. Yeah, so so basically, and in that architecture, would you recommend keeping the server and the database then on the OT side? If it was required to bring your job up, yes. But if it okay. if it was a simple case of, I mean, so much stuff now is virtually hosted in the cloud, then it doesn't really matter, mm -hmm. right? There's nothing landed on site. But yes, I mean, that's really a design choice. But it, it depends how fast you want to bring your network up and have your system running. Me personally, I would love to have everything hosted on the OT side because I could actually finish the job and walk away. And the only thing that we need is that mm -hmm. final connection to the IT side of the network. So speaking of that final connection, what are the big holdups you're seeing in as far as IT and BAS folks working together? What are, are I got to imagine their security, um, the labor for the IT groups because they seem to be really, really getting. I've noticed an increase in like their analness <laughs> on being, hey, I have to have something to charge my time to to work on your IT task. I don't know if you've noticed that, but I've, it used to be I could just bring in some donuts and they'd be like, oh yeah, here you go. But now it's like, do you have a job? Do you have approval? Where am I going to charge my time? <laughs> I'm laughing here because that's, uh, yeah, you nailed it exactly. The uh, Yeah, it seems like these guys are a little bit tighter than ever before. And I think 
in some ways they have a right because you've, with all the threat of cybersecurity out there now, then they really want to take control. They don't want to be the next target, which is a, a valid assessment. Yeah. But here's the reality. In the large building, I just brought on a thousand devices that you now that you IT have to go take care of. You know what? I don't think they even want to, right? And they just they want to make it hard and complicated so that you find another way. And, and what we're doing mm -hmm. is we're presenting another way. And I, I like to say, you know what? We're taking the pain away from IT. I know that you guys want to control the entire building, and we're not stopping that. Just let us do a portion of it for you, take some burden away from you. You can still have control. You can still handle the cybersecurity, but don't be the block. Let's work together. Let me do my part, and I'll make it easy for you, right? Helping you do your job. Okay. Yeah, that's fair. I mean, I, that's how I feel about things. It's, you know, I, I would say 20% of the IT folks I run into, it's, it's pure laziness, then 20% have, you know, ridiculous cybersecurity and IT standards. But the other 60%, it's just they're unfamiliar with what the heck we're asking them to do. And we're asking them to put their job on the line. I think it's reasonable for them to ask for more information than I'm sure you remember doing this. I did this. Oh, here's my cut sheet for my supervisory device that's going on your network. Have fun. <laughs> Uh, what is this? Uh, can you open port forty seven eight away for me? Huh? UDP? What do you mean? What are you talking about? Yeah. I don't. I don't get it. Exactly. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, why can't you do that? Um, okay, cool. So I've got one last question for you, which is: What is the biggest trend you're seeing right now in the IP controls and the OP networks that your o OT networks, not OP? overpowered networks um so <laughs> what is the big trends you're seeing here in 2018 that um you'd kind of want to highlight here you know what's coming forward and it, it's been happening for a while but everyone talks about iot which is what we're talking about here ip based networks and it's coming fast and it's coming mm -hmm. furious and it's taking time but it's really started to pick up and Everyone that's not already putting in IP-based controls, if you're not doing it now, it's, it's going to hit you hard. Because one day, the, the engineer and specifiers are just going to say it's all IP-based, and you're going to be left in the dust. So this wall of IP-enabled everything, it's here. It's here. Mm -hmm. It's reaching our buildings, and we need to be able to handle it. You need to be set up with the right gear, the right knowledge, uh, the right products to manage the proper skills gap and it, it's just training and coming forward in 2018 it's it's going to land more more than even 2017 it's just going to build and build and build so uh the biggest biggest trend is is yeah that's coming and you're going to see a lot more tools coming out you're going to see a lot more companies that are going to try and help that transition so uh, to all the listeners, I would say, don't be scared of it. Embrace it. It's definitely not going away. <laughs> and I would uh, you know, step forward and get in front of it to make sure that your business can handle it. Cool. I'm going to do something I've never, ever, ever done on a Building Automation Monthly podcast or article. And you're completely unprepared for this because I haven't mentioned it to you at all. But you guys gave me an actual trial of your visual backnet software. And I've got to say that that stuff was actually pretty awesome. I used it, messed around with it. It was actually pretty cool. Um, being that you and I are, and this is just in full transparency for the audience, you and I are working on a reseller, essentially affiliate, where I'm able to sell your visual backnet to folks. I just wanted you to take a second because even if folks never ever go through my link and go that way, I still, I really think this is a valuable tool that, I mean, it was just so clean and porting my Wireshark into it and just how it worked. Could you take, you know, one minute, just discuss that because it was something that 
I really thought as a former, and I still consider myself a tech. I mean, that was, I think it's something that would have saved me a lot of time. If I yeah, absolutely. It. Well, first, thank you for your kind words. Uh, we worked hard on that product. So, so yeah, for everyone out there, uh, Optigo has a product called Visual Backnet. And the primary reason for this tool is when we started stepping into building uh, automation networks, we realized that there's not really a good tool for troubleshooting your Backnet network. There's Wireshark, and the list stops there. So... You took a look at Wireshark and went, oh my God. You're looking at packet by packet. Yeah. Once you get the capture and start looking at the data, I have no idea what I'm looking at. I don't even know how to change this beast. So you just package it up, you ship it off to the manufacturer. They look at it and tell you a couple things and, and you try and work with it. But that's so time consuming. It didn't make any sense. So we created this tool to take that Wireshark capture and visualize it for you, right? You don't have to go from a customer's complaint and try and figure out what was wrong. We'll tell you what's wrong. We have 30 different checks in there that just says, you've got circular network, or you have duplicate device ID, or you have too many global broadcast, whatever the case may be. Right away as a tech, you can say, oh, wow, I do. Okay, dive in. Oh, it's this controller and that controller. Okay, I can go straight to it and fix it. That's what it's designed to do. So fix your backnet application layer problems as they come up. Now, if I had this when I was a tech, I would have used it and started running captures from the first controller I put in. Right? One controller, your network health score should be 100%. Two controllers should be the same. That way, every building that you turn over, solid 100%, solid network, hand it off to service, uh, and, and keep these buildings healthy. Yeah, and I mean, I, I really did and do like it. The, the red, yellow, green was pretty cool. And um, what, I, what I liked the most about it was I feel as if techs are going to get an education around what BACnet is by using the tool. <laughs> it's kind of funny because there's a lot of stuff that, I mean, if you're a tech, unless you encounter an error, you don't know what to look for. And so it's looking for things like duplicate networks and duplicate device instances, which, I mean, you and I, we've experienced those failures, but for a new person coming on, they don't necessarily know to look for that stuff. So not to belabor the point, but I just, I very rarely find stuff that gets me super excited. I could think of one other thing, which was kind of what EZIO was doing with their new VPN in their field controller. But I mean, this was a really cool tool. So I just wanted to say that because I, I don't normally do that. Well, thank you. I appreciate it. Yep. So with that being said, Ryan, do you have any parting words prior to ending this interview? Uh, I just I just want to say thank you, Phil, to, uh, for the discussion. It was great uh, for anyone out there. The just feel feel free to ask any questions at any time. But uh, you can reach out to Phil, or or uh, he knows how to find me. And yep, uh, please enjoy your 2018, and uh, let's get ready for these this uh, wall of IP IoT devices coming. Awesome, Ryan. Thanks so much. Thank you, Phil. Appreciate it. Alrighty, folks, that was an awesome interview. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did and that you learned a ton from that interview. All of the show notes and any resources mentioned in this episode are going to be available at buildingautomationmonthly.com forward slash 101. Once again, that is buildingautomationmonthly.com forward slash 101. And if after hearing Ryan and I talk, you're kind of wondering about some of these IT concepts, maybe some of the words we threw around, maybe some of the things that we said didn't make a whole lot of sense to you, but you realize that you need to learn more about IT because that's the place where the building automation industry is going. Well, you're not out of luck. I've got you covered. I have a fully online 
lifetime access training course dedicated to information technology. So you don't have to travel around the country going from class to class, learning from folks who have never, ever been in the building automation industry. Nope. You can learn from me, a expert in the building automation and IT space. I'll teach you everything you need to know about information technology. And you can find out more about that at buildingautomationmonthly.com forward slash 101. Scroll down to where you see information technologies for BAS professionals and click on that link and learn more about how to future-proof your career when it comes to IT knowledge. All right, folks, that's it for this week, and I will see you next week on the Building Automation Monthly Podcast. Take care.